hello everyone, and um, it's nice to be back. Um, it's good to meet you all uh, again this evening. Um, as you know, we sort of have migrated over the kind of last year from um, this time last year, I was talking to you about kind of carbon footprinting methodologies. Um, and then the group of you came together, um, for those of you at the AGM last night, who sort of said we need a consistent way of doing this across the board. Um, and discussions then happened with Kenneth um, and ourselves to um, get to a point where we can help and, and help deliver this for you. So today I'm kind of going to give you a bit of background of what it is and how, how we're working to develop it. Um, we are, it is um, also a, sort of, if you like, a work in progress. Um, and we also have uh, Fraser, who's um, from the Spring Environmental Team, is here with me today. And we'll have our laptops open. So we actually have got a um, sort of prototype version with us today. So um, we're getting a table set up, and you can kind of come and have a look and see what it looks like at the end. And we'll take any feedback and obviously work that into the build. Um, so yes, like we'll try and make it as, as interactive as, as possible. Um, we've got a little bit about us. I'll skim through that because I think there's a lot of familiar faces in the room, um, some of which we're, you know, companies we're working with, so I won't overdo that bit. And then we'll talk about the sort of carbon footprint methodology and then next steps and, and so on. Um, so um, Spring Environmental, um, at the moment we're working with Cotswold, Oxford, York Archaeology um, and ARS as well. Um, we've got people working on um, UK infrastructure projects of which archaeology has been part of as well. Um, and then we also um, still work with a lot with um, major telecommunications and PLCs on their supply chains, which gives us a sort of insight into how, if you like, your major clients are likely to be um, sort of engaging with you on sustainability because telecommunications, right or wrongly, has been sort of engaging on these issues for sort of about 15 years now. And a lot of what they've been doing is sort of spreading out, if you like, into the wider world. For us as an organization, our desire is basically to be able to help people across all project phases from concept um, all the way through to, to operate. So if you need environmental permitting, I'm not saying every, any of you would, have, would or do so, but you know, in other clients, we also help them with um, legal issues, um, such as not d double checking where the boundary is on the triple SI before you get the excavator out. Um, so we will kind of support organizations in, in all manner of um, forms. Um, so here's, here's our team, obviously is myself. Um, there's four on here. We've got a fifth arriving um, shortly. Um, and as I say, Fraser's here. Many of you may have met Charlotte already because she's our sort of um, mathematician coder. So she's the one who's actually putting a lot of the um, fame calculator together at the moment. Um, so just quickly, just for, as a reminder, why are we doing this? Um, you can see that big red band, um, which is where our climate is meant to head in terms of change of um, change in temperature. If we don't really do anything, where um, and, and carry on with business as, as usual. Um, and then you've got this sort of aspirational where we think science is telling us to go on the one and a half degree pathway um, and what we need to do about emissions to make sure that we stay on there. And clearly there's a big gap between kind of where we're heading and, um, and the impacts of if anybody's had the, um, the time or willingness to read the sort of latest IPCC summaries about what happens if we do get this two and a half to 2.9 degree heating. It doesn't look good, um, to be frank, for, for humanity. Um, it's a sort of, um, sort of almost like disaster film kind of reading to it, um, you know, famine, migration, um, biodiversity collapse, the whole sort of lot. So it, it really is something that we should be, um, you know, have a great goal to avoid. Um, just quickly, for those of it not familiar, um, I thought before I kind of jump in a bit more on the methodology, we probably have to set the scene about kind of carbon footprinting as much um, or as quickly and as simply as we can. Um, so if you'll hear people talk about scope one, two, and three, um, and scope one is essentially where you take energy and then you burn it and you turn it into um, CO2 and release it to the... Um, so you are the person, if you like, directly releasing the CO2 in that scope. In scope two, generally electricity can occasionally be steam. And in that one, think about it, someone else is, if you like, burning the energy to release the CO2, but you're buying energy, you're not buying a thing. 
And scope three is kind of everything else, um, both upstream and downstream. So it's the goods and services that you buy, it's the waste that you produce, it's the business travel, the train that got you here, hopefully. Um, and it's also the downstream impacts as well. So um, for those who make electronics and things like that, it's about the energy that's used in your equipment um, as it's sort of, if you like, sat here on the desk as well. I'm assuming that franchises are probably not a big thing for anyone in the room, so um, I'll kind of I'll ignore that later on. So just taking a step back as to why we're creating a carbon methodology as well. Um, so the prime mover, if you like, at the moment, but not the only one, um, is that um, national highways want project-based carbon footprint reporting based on the 2080 stand, um, past 2080 standard um, by the end of 2025. Um, there are some sort of, if you like, um, differences between their expectations for large and, and smaller um, organizations. But fundamentally, if you like, we have to build it with the most technically challenging in, um, situation in mind um, and go from there. What we also are sort of mindful of is that because there's um, sort of there's a quite potential for similar but different requests that we're trying to build a tool with as much flexibility to accommodate different requests from different um, stakeholders. So that's why the um, survey came out, um, the one based on SOHO that, that Kenneth um, sent round of sort of a week or two ago. And for the three companies that have responded to that, thank you very much. Um, interesting that two of you said we've never been asked for this data, um, which is both um, an in interesting situation because it's not there yet, but it's likely to start coming in more kind of force, I think, for you in the next few years. And for the one who attached um, the net zero requirements um, as well, that was kind of really interesting reading as to what they are looking for. And in that one, they're actually not looking for you to provide any carbon footprint data, but to do want the raw material, like all the inputs, so that they can do the carbon footprint on your behalf. And this is part of the whole kind of, if you like, um, variability that we um, expect and we're trying to build um, the methodology and the calculator around. But by and large, in the methodology, sort of what we really need to do is educate stakeholders as to the significant sources. Looking at that um, uploaded document that I've just mentioned, it could probably be argued that there are significant sources missing from their um, their data request to you. Um, so that's key. Um, and then we also need to ensure that the um, true impacts are ac accurately and consistently reported. Um, if one organization, if you like, um, cuts out bits of the carbon footprint, then clearly um, we have a sort of bit of a challenge in terms of comparison and, and understanding the true impact of what we're doing. Um, I've mentioned the sort of apples to apples basis and that, that's a kind of key part of the methodology and the reasons why we're doing it. As far as we can, um, I don't want to, you know, I want you all guys to kind of understand carbon footprinting, but I don't necessarily want you to be technical experts in it um, because um, in the same way you probably don't want me to be a, a technical expert in every last detail on, on archaeology. So to make it usable, we need to kind of, if you like, bring down the complexity of the topic as much as we can so that it's easy to use. Um, it's understandable, if you like, but it's not, um, it's, if you like, all of the background it's about making sure that there's consistent boundaries for carbon factors is probably something that we should be worrying about on your behalf, not, not for you guys um, individually. And then lastly, we also need to develop that approach, as you can imagine, topping and tailing, um, that we develop approach that will meet the requirements of past 2018. I'll talk a little bit about, about that next. So as a quick reminder of PAS 2080, so my personal um, view is it's a bit of a mishmash of a standard. It's part of ISO 14001, which is an, at the sort of organizational environmental level. It's part life cycle assessment. Um, and it actually makes it quite a sort of tricky standard in some ways to understand what kind of scope and level it wants to see things happening on a consistent basis. Um, and so, is, does it want at the project level or does it want certain bits at the organizational level? So there's been a lot of time spent kind of pouring over the standards, trying to figure out where exactly um, it wants to see and 
in relation to archaeology, where we've got no historic precedent, let's say, um, where is the right kind of place to, to expect this kind of action? Um, so I think, um, you know, ultimately, PAS 28 is also a framework. It's not necessarily, um, it doesn't have any requirements on you to set a particular target. So it says that you need to um, sort of baseline and then um, ultimately um, kind of figure out ways to reduce your carbon footprint and then measure as you go. But it doesn't tell you that you need to, as a project, um, find a 10% reduction compared to your baseline. There's no kind of like specifics on that. So over a longer period of time, um, realistically, it needs to kind of interface and, and um, national highways have made their commitment to net zero. So it's used as, a, if you like, a tool in the framework to get us towards net zero. So as I mentioned, this is kind of um, picking up on um, the model, if you like, in PAS 2080. So it's got things like leadership. And it's so this is a bit where at leadership level, that's probably something that I think is best done in, in this space at the organizational level. We don't expect, if you like, we have to have different leadership approaches within the same organization for every single project, I think would be quite confusing and chaotic. Um, but in terms of target setting and baselines, it's very clear that that needs to happen at the project level. Um, so in terms of the tool and the methodology, we're developing the kind of key parts that we are, if you like, trying to answer in um, in the calculation methodology is the target setting and baselines part, the assessment part, so this is how can we reduce, and then the monitoring and reporting side. And um, so our tool is kind of built on these, um, if you like, um, elements. The rest is sort of more how the organization is going to enact as 2080, um, which we can't really write the methodology for uh, fully. So one of the chat, I've mentioned that I need to kind of build this tool and this methodology with a, a level of flexibility that you might get different requests from different stakeholders. Um, and one of the um, elements is that PAS 2080 is asking you to carbon footprint individual projects. And that may, um, that, that's kind of good, but you may get another stakeholder who, and this is typical practice in sort of, if you like, sustainability reporting, where they go, can you give us our, your corporate carbon footprint and we will essentially prorate it, prorate your carbon, corporate carbon footprint by my revenue divided by your total revenue. And so trying to foresee that one coming is that we're trying to build this tool in a way that actually it would give you a good um, uh, kind of like a, a reasonably accurate kind of prediction of what your kind of overall car, corporate carbon footprint would be if you were diligent enough to input essentially all of your projects. I'm not saying that you have to. I'm not saying that um, on, but what I'm saying is that if you were to use it in that way, you would also potentially have the ability to respond to um, sort of non pas 2080 compliant data requests as well. Um, so clearly, as you can, um, I've, I've written it in words, but sort of the mathematician wants to, but essentially the more projects you input into it, the tool will basically trend towards um, it being a good answer to your corporate carbon footprint, if you need to know that. So what standards do, have, do we have to actually help develop this methodology? So I've written it down here, which part of the was it was, I think it was 7.11 in the past 2080. Um, sorry, 7.1.3 um, is that um, there's a requirement to select from existing life cycle assessment standards how you're going to calculate your footprint in, um, for past, in PAS 2080. And the ones that they then mention um, in PAS 2080 are these ones to, to the left, which is um, EN 15978, which is about the environmental performance of building. And there's huge amounts of kind of um, documentation in that about the use of the building and what happens at the end of its life and how you're going to deconstruct it, which clearly isn't a kind of, um, a, if you like, a set of requirements that's easy to, to meet for, for what you guys do. And similarly for, you know, civil engineering works is closer, but again, there's a lot about kind of use phase and end of life phase um, in, in that. Um, 
and then environmental product declarations all fall down almost instantly because there's nothing physical to me measure in, in, that, in the same way. Um, what we'd also find is that for environmental product declaration, you're expected to have a standard kind of, you know, block or um, a product, if you like, whereas clearly um, as soon as you get into more service-based, the actual thing that you're doing has kind of um, the boundary of what it is and, and what you're delivering changes, which makes it very difficult to, to use those. Um, so then we have to flip over onto more onto the sort of generic methodologies, if you like. So we've got the greenhouse gas protocol. Well, these aren't the updated, um, it's the older slide, sorry. Um, so there's three typos. So if you can spot them all in this slide, um, then um, good on you. You obviously didn't, didn't get too, uh, too merry last night. Um, so um, you've got the corporate standards, you've got the greenhouse gas protocol product standard, and then you've got ISO 14,040 and 44, which are life cycle assessment standards. And going, I, there's actually quite a few um, uh, on, on this. And none of them are really perfect because they're all designed around the idea that you've got something physical that you're selling and that you're kind of a manufacturer of goods, not a, a provider of a service. So that, you know, if you like, none of them are perfect. And that makes this kind of PAS 2080 kind of requirement that you have to select from an existing LCA standard more tricky, um, which, but then also comes back to the whole reason why we're developing this methodology. So we're essentially now divine, de defining this clause for ourselves. Um, does that make sense? I hope that wasn't too loopy in its kind of um, uh, thought process. But what we also need to do is then make sure that in the methodology that we're developing that we're not sort of, um, if you like, so out there that it's not linked with these common standards as well. So moving on to kind of like what are the key factors of the things, if you like, within the methodology that we're looking for and, um, and, and what, if you like, what the challenge is, challenge is and ultimately, I guess, what the fame and, and the forum is paying for. Um, is to deal with the kind of issues of, um, this is from the greenhouse gas protocol um, product standard, what they call attributable and non-attributable properties of projects um, or delivery. Um, I've got materiality here. I actually tried to, uh, on the, so it, you'll see it called cut off, but essentially they're the same concept. Um, so what are essentially, what are the small contributors to the carbon footprint? They're going to take us an absolute age to collect the data on, but ultimately aren't going to change the dial at the end. So essentially, what can I exclude to make your lives slightly easier? Um, and, and that kind of comes down to that ease of data, data availability um, question. And then the last question, we, we also need to deal with allocation of emissions. So there will be, you know, for each project, if you like, um, it may use the, uh, the corporate office, but it won't, it's not using it for the full year. It's not using it. There are other people in the room and they're doing different projects or doing marketing or various other parts, you know, finance parts of the corporate function. And we need to kind of essentially find a reliable and consistent way that we can, if you like, divide that up um, to, um, into the project um, uh, part of the, the footprint. That's not super easy. And there's, um, if you look at life cycle assessment on allocation, um, there is tons of academic um, sort of people arguing one case over another, um, whether that be by physical space, so whether it be by economic approaches or whether it's by um, what's called substitution. So we would imagine that we have a, rather than dividing up your corporate office, we would imagine, well, what's the carbon footprint of, if you like, needing a, a desk for someone for you know, three weeks for that particular project, for example. Um, so it's something that we need to kind of deal with and do it in a way that um, essentially the, uh, is probably defensible and robust. Um, I'll talk a bit about more on that one. In terms of the, G the greenhouse gas model, then we also need to look at the carbon factor availability for um, how we're going to measure the input data. Um, and we've tried to, as best to um, in terms of ease of data availability to harmonize with the um, standard method of measurement so that if you're using those kind of techniques, then you already have the data and you input into that into the carbon footprint, which then essentially hopefully means that you're not looking for, for new data, so to speak. It's part of your normal profit and loss um, or approaches for, for 
monitoring um, projects. So, um, but the, that, the, while that's great for you as users, the downside to that for that as kind of the creators of the project is that we have to make sure that there is a carbon factor that matches each one of these lines on the standard method of measurement that is kind of robust and um, and has kind of consistent boundaries. So, and by that I mean that you know if one factor includes say the emissions related to the capital formation, so um, making that excavator. But the other one only really, um, as well as the sort of energy use of the excavator and moving the excavator to site, whereas the next carbon factor only really looks at the energy consumption at the point of delivery and forgets about all of those wider issues, then we will end up with a kind of a methodology that, if you like, is, for want of a better phrase, all over the place. And that's, um, that's kind of like a key part of our role. And similarly, then, with the carbon factor, we've got to make sure that um, the um, various uh, sort of um, conversion factors from methane and um, other greenhouse gases are consistent um, between uh, in all of those carbon factors as well. Because again, otherwise we end up with a sort of, if you like, not methodologically robust um, uh, kind of output. We need to be mindful that over time that um, that you may want to input supplier specific data. So if, you know, rather than using, if you like, the generic carbon factor that um, for particular service, um, let's again keep on with the excavator example, that you um, either get provided or um, you have the choice to have a biodiesel um, uh, powered one over a sort of fossil fuel diesel, then we need to be able to kind of essentially reflect that in the model. Otherwise, we're overestimating and we're going away from, if you like, that this kind of consistency and robustness um, argument. And then something that um, I don't think is here, but Roger ARS has been very keen on in terms of discussions is making sure that we reflect what's called biogenic emissions in there. So when, um, uh, when excavation takes place, um, there is actually quite a lot of CO2 that's basically in little pockets under the soil um, when we release that. Now, one way of arguing is that, well, actually that came from um, through photosynthesis and it's kind of the natural breakdown, it's part of the natural cycle anyway. Um, but also, if you look at some of the other models, um, they are included. So we need to kind of make sure that that's covered off. And our, at the moment, our, our approach is to include it and we will harmonize right. with um, what's called the Woodland Carbon Code, which has a, um, a set of a calculation methodology that if you were to create a new woodland on arable land or whatever type of land you want it to be, um, then there is a sort of um, carbon emissions, if you like, released at the point where you prepare the land for that kind of project. And I think it's probably, again, there are lots of ones out there, but there's not really many commonly accepted approaches. And I think harmonizing with that one that is developed by the Forestry Commission um, and um, if you like, is used at the UK government level is probably the best way forward for us. Um, and we talked about sort of the reporting boundary side, and then clearly one of the things that um, PAS 2080 is asking us to do is essentially kind of forecast your carbon footprint at the beginning, take action to reduce it, and then monitor as you go along and be able to report. Um, and so when we're building the tool, we've got to actually kind of be mindful that we've got, we've got to record if you like, the start and the prediction and then all the way through and the out outcome at the end. Um, so, um, yes, the, the, that's kind of an interesting, because um, we end up with two essentially separate data sets for, um, for every project. Um, and then the final point I kind of want to make in this one is about being auditable. So um, there is, in, you will for the large organization of the national highways, they have to pass, um, sort of get third party certification um, for, for their PAS 2080 approach. And carbon footprint tools where, if you like, there's the freedom to override data, accidentally multiply things by the wrong factors and so on and so forth is probably not a robust way forward. Um, so the tool is sort of being built with the idea that um, essentially if you make an input um, if you then realize you need to modify it for whatever reason, it will create an equal, equal and opposite record, and then you will have to justify why you're changing the original record, and there will be a kind of record of all of, all of those changes made. And we have a sim similar um, platform out with a, um, for another client, um, not quite sure, 
they're in the oil and gas industry. I'll get it out there. <laughs> um, out there now. Um, is that the right? You know, and, um, but ultimately, that approach has been audited multiple times by different audit bodies, and it's never been a problem by essentially making sure that you know, like their carbon footprint, all of their sites across the world get done. So we end up with literally millions of lines per year. Um, on that, but there's never been an issue because we can literally see every change and why it's changed from, from day to day. So looking at what's attributable and the kind of materiality or, or cutoff, um, essentially I've kind of tried to um, divide this up into the project stage so that we can kind of narrow down at different parts of the project stage what you need to fill in rather than having to fill out everything or leaving lots of gaps or leaving, if you like, users confused, do I need to fill this in at this stage? Um, and for lots of the, if you like, the office-based ones, that's essentially where you've got the blue. Um, it, you know, we need to kind of collect the data. But you'll see that waste generation here has been grayed out as being Im immaterial. And um, fugitive emissions, which typically is emissions from things like um, your air conditioning units, in the carbon footprints that we've done for archaeology members, they've often been less than 1% or, or zero um, um, of the um, kind of overall carbon footprint. So again, it's one of those situations where we're going to say, look, we're going to kind of not worry about this because, to be frank, um, it's, it's such a tiny part of your overall carbon footprint. Um, the material ones, as you can see, um, are much more kind of focused on the actual kind of time that, you know, uh, you're on site, really. Um, I think not. Um, there are actually, for those of you very sharp eyes or very familiar with kind of carbon footprinting, there are further um, scope three um, categories here, but I've kind of chopped them off for ease of being able to read this on this um, at this scale. Um, and it's because things like franchise investments and things like that, I don't think are relevant to project-based carbon footprinting. That is one thing just to mention, if you are use, if those are relevant to you at an organizational level, then that's one of the, if you like, the um, kind of like trade-offs with um, using this as your corporate carbon footprint, you would need to add those on. So as I said, in terms of ease of data availability, we're, also, we're trying to align the tool, as we said, with the, um, the standard method of, of measurement. Um, but also within the tool, give you the ability that if you don't have, if you like, ideal data, that there's a flow chart that you can follow to go and get, um, if you like, the appropriate data. So there will always be, um, you will have the ability to generate it. So this example, it comes from a building. So do you have essentially monthly, quarterly, or annual, um, you know, this is for electricity strictly, um, electricity available via actual meter readings? Okay, yes, if you do, then you can go off, you can find the data, and then we'll calculate it using these carbon factors. And then if you go through to the no, um, you know, essentially, if you've got a, um, a site that is either new or the landlord controls the data and you can't get access to it, then we can use an approximation from, um, from what's called SIBZ Guide F, um, which has benchmarks for various different type of um, building types. So um, ultimately, like in terms of accuracy, if you're at the top of this, um, this list, clearly your carbon footprint will be more accurate. But then um, what we have to do is be in a situation for consistency of the boundary between all of, if you like, um, you guys' organizations using this. We don't end up with a situation where, um, if you like, you're like, well, I don't have that data, so I'll just exclude it out of my reporting. So. We will have consistency, even if, if you like, the, um, using SIBZ Guide F is not the preferred method. So in terms of the output, we will be able to see it later. Um, we, you will be able to kind of, um, we have essentially the corporate level, we've got the project level um, reporting, which will do sort of like the forecast versus actual. Um, and then we've also got the, um, at, at Kenneth's request, we've also added in um, client-based reporting. So all of your, um, you know, sort of projects delivered by one, you know, for one um, particular client, you can um, filter on. And then also similarly at local authority level as well. So I think if anybody's got any other extra sort of, you know, um, thoughts about um, 
the level at which data reporting would be useful. It would be very helpful to know see sooner rather than later because it, um, as time goes on, it becomes harder for us to sort of divert track and add things in. And one of the key parts is that we'll also give you like a, what's called um, CSV um, Excel download of what's, of what's called the inventory. So it will have, if you like, the raw data input. So how many liters of fuel did we say that we used? And then the carbon as well on it. So that um, if any of your clients, including national highways, want to sort of pull that into their wider um, uh, kind of like carbon footprinting tools, then it's easy for them to do. There's not a lot of kind of, if you like, uh, copying and pasting data for them to do. Um, so that's kind of the element tool. In terms of next steps, so timelines. Um, am I on time, Penny? Okay. Um, this good job. This is the last slide. Then, because um, clearly we've kind of we've done a number of bits of work. We still have the um, the survey open. So if anybody's got any kind of like requirements or requests from your customers that we think um, it would be really useful to see to make sure that this tool is kind of as flexible to meet all those needs as possible. Um, and then throughout kind of basically the summer um, and into September, we'll be finalizing this, if you like, the draft version of the methodology um, and going out to consultation. So you'll all have the opportunity to input. Um, I think we agreed to do it via a, a sort of team support or, or you know, um, prep and, and webinar, didn't we? Um, and then, um, and then obviously we need to finalize it and then build the tool and allow essentially um, get it out there for use. Um, and we will be supporting the tool um, within with fame for I think, a year, essentially post launch as well. So um, that's us. Um, so that's where we are. Hopefully that helped. Um, hopefully it wasn't so much jargon that you were wondering what what is actually going on. Um, but if, is there any questions at this stage?